Hey everybody, I'm April Coble Eller from Coble Water Ski and Wakeboard Camp and we're here to teach you how to ski or ski better. So we're going to start out with basically two ski skiing. I think everybody here is beyond that now, but I like to start with that for a reason. When we're teaching people how to ski on two skis, we teach them how to get up. And if you haven't seen my little YouTube video, there's a water ski and wakeboard made easy with April Coble Eller. It's really helpful. It teaches on land first and then goes into <clears throat> in the water. But after we teach somebody to get up, we start gently going back and forth. How do you go back and forth? You shift your weight. So we're teaching people how to shift weight. And then we teach going over the wakes. And then we teach walking on water where you put all your weight on one foot, you shift all of your weight to the other, and that then determines what foot goes in the front. Okay, so there's a little thing you can do where you push somebody from behind, and if they step on that foot, it's about 75% accurate that you'll that will be your front foot. So June, let me just come stand here for a second. You're in another video. So look that way. Okay, I'm just going to push her. You're right foot forward, aren't you? Are you left foot forward? <laughs> when, when you ski, when you ski, are you left or right? Oh, you are left. Well, that worked then. Okay. So I pushed her. She stepped on her left foot. I thought she stepped on her, I mean, I thought she was right foot forward. <clears throat> excuse me. So about, <clears throat> excuse me, 75% of the time that little drill works as long as somebody doesn't know you're going to do it. Um, but walking on water really does work. So once somebody stands on one foot and stand on the other, you'll know right away which one's should know right away which foot you like standing on the best. That determines which foot goes in the front. So then once we start getting up on one ski, <clears throat> did you get up on one today? Did you have an okay time getting up on one? I had to use a kicker ski today. <clears throat> you, I, I like to think you got to use one. You, yeah, you got to use one because it helps so much and I have, there is nothing, no shame to be had in dropping a ski. I love it. It saves your body, saves your forearms, it saves your hands. Okay, so I love dropping a ski. That's the next thing that we do. So once we decide which foot goes in the front, then we shift weight, let the foot slide back, teach people how to drop a ski. So we, even the staff, like once a year we go out together and everybody has to remember how to drop a ski because that's the easiest way to teach how to drop a ski. Um, so then we teach how to get up on one ski. Sometimes you can get up with a foot in, the back foot in or the back foot out, doesn't matter. Um, typically we teach if you're smaller, when I say smaller, like a kid, <laughs> um, and, and sometimes adults, we will teach both feet in, um, but a lot of times if we are older or if you have done it that way before, we teach dragging a foot. Um, some people drag a foot, some people get in with both feet in, okay? But once you're up on the ski, so let's say I'm up on one ski, I have my left foot for demonstration, I'm really light, right foot forward, but left foot in front and the right foot in the back, okay? There's a position that I look for as soon as you get up that I want to see. From the minute you get up, it's important to have this position so I know that you are safe and you are locked in, okay? And that is a straight line. If I take my pelvis and tilt it under, there's a straight line between my knees and my neck. Can you see that? Now, there are two places in your body, pretend like I'm holding onto a handle. There are two places in your body you can break. You can break here, or you can be soft there, or you can break here, okay? We don't ever wanna break here for several reasons. Number one, you hurt your back. Number two, you can go over the front. The ski is not designed to have that much weight on the front of the ski, okay? So if you can ride a ski with your shoulders back for men or hips up for women, women are hip heavy, guys are chest heavy. So if we can have shoulders back for men, tilted the pelvis and hips up for women, and a straight line from my knees to my neck, that's the position that we want to be in. What do you do with your arms? Okay, you take your elbows, you put them right to your side, and you grab the handle. Okay, does that make sense? One of my instructors used to say, pretend like you have newspapers tucked right under your armpits right there, and you're going to hold those newspapers right there. Okay, how many of you ski like this? That's normal. Okay, that's normal, but we need to try to get those elbows in. I'm not telling you to pull the rope in. I'm telling you to d not let the rope, the boat pull the rope away from you. Okay, if the boat is trying to pull the rope away from you, you have this tendency to be pulled forward. If you want that feeling to go away, then be stingy with that rope. Get your shoulders back, roll your shoulders back, stick your chest right up through your arms, take your elbows and squeeze them to your side and then soften your knees. And that is the strongest position that you can ride a slalom ski. If you go on any video of pros, okay, watch the stance when they get up and they're about to pull out for the gates. It's exactly what I'm telling you. 
And we all do that. We all need to do that from the first time you learn to slalom ski until you're running short line, if you do a course or if you free ski. That is the safest, strongest, most efficient body position there is. Okay, does anybody think you'd have trouble getting into that position? Yes, why? Leaning too far forward. As soon as something happens, I tend to lean forward okay. automatically. Okay, so that was happening with Dr. John this morning. And the minute I said, soften your knees and absorb the weights with your knees, everything shifted from being high and heavy to low and steady. Okay, so as soon as I said, just soften the knees, let your knees absorb that weight or that, that stress, really, then the pull came away from the upper body. So that's something we'll work on tomorrow. We'll work on taking the, the pulling point from the boat and making it lower. Okay, what else? Was it you? Somebody raised their hand. You didn't think you could do it. Yes, it's always the same. I always find like when I'm in trouble. I, okay, I, I get I'll tell you another reason that happens. Um, so a lot of coaches will tell you to get your handle close to the hip. Okay, there are two ways you can try to execute that. Okay, you can take the handle and push it down with your lats. If you have massive, strong lats, you can do that. Okay, but generally, if you try to push the handle close to the hips, you're going to take your chest forward, right? You're pulling yourself towards the boat, and that's a problem. And that's what you're talking about. Okay, if you take the elbows, squeeze them to your side, let the forearm be an extension of the rope that goes straight to the boat, and then just take your pelvis and tilt it under, shoulders back like this. And all of a sudden, my handle and my hip are really close without thinking about pushing it down. I never push the handle down. Some coaches coach that way, but I think it's unfair to think that way because I think it's too hard. Again, I'm trying to find the simplest ways to make little movements that make a big difference. Okay? Once you're up on the ski, okay, does everybody understand that? Sorry. Everybody understand that? Could you do that one more time? I can. I can. So up on the ski, and I see a lot of people who I call ski in the fetal position or the safety position where you drop your hips back. That's dangerous, okay? Because, again, your chest has to go over your front of your ski because your hips are back. But if you just take your pelvis and tilt it under, guys, just, your, guys have little rear ends, okay? <laughs> just throw your shoulders back and your butt comes up. <laughs> Women, we have to think about taking our hips and shoving them up because that's where we're hip heavy. Okay, and then our shoulders will go back. So if you stand like that, take your elbows, hold them to your side, put your hands together, that's the position that you want to be in. I'm going there next. Okay. Yep, that's perfect. All right, so how do you know which hand goes up or down on the handle? Okay, ideally, whichever foot you have in the front, your opposite palm faces up, okay? So if your right foot forward, your left palm faces up, and here's why. Your lower <coughs> body is gonna lean harder in the direction of what foot you have in the front. So if I'm right foot forward, it's really easy for me to lean to the right. Yes, you feel that? Okay, whichever palm faces up, it's easier for your upper body to drive that way, yes? If you have the opposing hand up, then you have symmetry in your body. If you don't, if you ski like me, and you have right foot forward and right hand up, you have an amazing lean one way, almost too much, and it's really hard to go back the other way. So bar none, unless you've been doing it for 50 years and it's really hard to change, which some of us have been doing it that long. Um, we at least will remind you of the fact that as instructors we should tell you that, because that is the preferred way. Um, some people do it fine and some people don't want to change. But that, that is the way you should do it and that is why. Um, they're about, it's about 1% of the population who stacks it and does both right foot forward, right hand up or left foot forward, left hand up. Mom and I do that, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, are you? Okay. Have you tried the other way? I've tried it. You've tried. You, so if you try it, if you haven't been doing it very long and you try it the other way and it doesn't bother you, stay that way. But if you try it and you go, I don't even know if I can even grab the handle. It just feels so weird, then it's okay. There are ways to overcome it. So there, there are pros and cons to both. Okay, so we talked about grip. You understand grip now? Okay. Also with your grip, make sure, thank you, 
that you are not squeezing the handle. If you are over gripping and squeezing the handle, that is gonna cause bad blisters and it's gonna cause forearms to fatigue really quickly. A better way to hold the handle is to let the handle roll right into here, okay? Right here in your fingertips. If you take your hands and you literally just make a hook, okay? Your forearms are so much stronger that way than grabbing all the way. My sister used to grip the handle, like over grip it and let it come like this and she constantly had blisters in her hands and I had none. I mean, I have this little row right here um, of calluses just because I hold it there. I even, my fingers are really short and I had an elliptical shaped handle. It was like, like that. So the ellipse would go in my, in my fingers right there. Not the round part. I used to have that kind of handle. So yeah, do that. Give your forearms a break because they get fatigued really quickly. Okay. Any other questions about body position on the ski? Not yet. No. Let's go into what size ski you should be on. Okay. When you are first learning, the bigger the better. I have had a six-year-old on a 69-inch ski and she popped up like it was a surfboard <laughs> because she had so much surface area. Surface area is your friend. Surface area keeps you sometimes from going over the front and it, it masks your um, inadequacies technically, <laughs> okay? So if you are not technically sound yet and you're having a hard time f falling forward on the ski or whatnot, you definitely want a bigger ski, okay? So at least your height, um, I'm 65 and a half, 66 inches and I ride a 65 or a 66 inch ski, but that's at 34 miles an hour. Okay, the slower you go, the bigger yet it can be. And skis come longer and or they come wider. So if you get a ski um, like the Senate, this, this radar Senate is going to be a smidge wider than, say, one of the new syndicates, the works, okay? A smidge. But that smidge all the way around from the, in, the, from the back of the front boot, which is where, is where they put it, around the front here, that's a lot of surface area. You can't even visibly see the difference hardly in the width. And you also need to look at the tails. If you look at the tail of this in it, it's considerably wider than the tail of that one. That is for turn radius, okay? So if the tail of the ski is really skinny, it's going to just slide really quick in the turn. You don't need that until you're going faster or until you're going shorter rope. You need support from a wider one. So if somebody says to me, if I buy this $2,800 ski, is it going to make me run short line? Maybe. Depends on how hard you practice. But maybe not because it may not be supportive enough to even be able to run your slower speeds, okay? So when I'm looking at somebody's ski and I'm sizing a ski for somebody, if you are, let's say, going, you know, you've just learned to get up and you're going 26 miles an hour and I'm teaching you the mini course, I'm going to put you, male or female, really regardless of the size, on something like a 67 or a 69-inch ski that's a little bit wider. More surface area, less likely to skip out on you, just real um, predictable, Okay, and then as we start to go faster, and as you start to turn harder, and as your body position gets better through the weights, then we can go a little narrower, maybe a little shorter, although Nate Smith weighs 150 pounds, and he skis on the 67. So the width. Right, and makes the ski work because of the way he rides it. So uh, again, I think bigger is better. I think Whitney's still riding a 67, Whitney McClintock, and she's probably 150 and runs a really short line. Um, so yeah, bigger is better, it's, as long as you can make it turn it. Where should your boots be on the ski? There's always a stock setting. Each company who makes these skis, they test these skis with their pro riders all the time. And it doesn't matter, so when I skied for HO, I would go down to Orlando in, in the winter time and we would test skis and, I mean, until my hands were ripped. And I would ride them and I would give them feedback on where the boot should be and what the fin setting should be and all that. And that's kind of how they come up with the, the stock numbers, okay? Um, but we, I ski differently than you do, and I weigh different, you know, a different weight than you. So, so those are a, a general idea of where to start. They're not like set in stone. Um, so if you start on the stock settings, which is generally your center hole on the ski, um, if you need the ski to engage more coming into the turn, we would move the boots forward. If you don't soften your, like if, if softening your knees isn't enough coming into a turn to make the ski engage more, then we might move the boots forward one hole. Okay, if you come across the weights and you're always shifting forward, we may move the boots back a hole. If you're having trouble turning your own side, and we assume that the fin is set up right, because we can do a lot of adjusting with the fin that can make some big, big differences. But if it's just, let's say, a, 
a boot move. If I'm seeing you turn your offside really nicely, but your onside wants to turn and then maybe wheelie, or it wants to turn and go down the leg a little bit, I'll spread your feet. Okay, so there's actually, um, if your front foot is here and your back foot is here, you want one finger width between them. If they're touching, sometimes it makes it harder for your own side to turn. If they're too far apart, we find people struggling to find center. Like, where's my balance? If your feet, and unfortunately, most all skis come set up too far apart. They'll have two, three, four inches between the feet, especially if you have small feet. It's not as bad if you have bigger feet. But for women, if you try to get into a pair of boots, they'll easily be three or four inches between them. And so in that case, when you try to tuck your pelvis under, but your feet are too far apart, um, it's really hard to make the center of gravity be between your feet. And that's where it needs to be. So when you tuck your pelvis right between your feet is where the center of gravity, gravity needs to be. Okay, because that's just a balance thing. So any questions about boot setup on a ski? Can I talk about boots in general? So there are three types of boots, okay? There are lace-up boots, okay? There are rubber boots that you have to use soap to get into. And then there's a, a hard shell boot that you have to clip in like a snow ski boot. Okay, those are our three general categories for ski boots. Rubber boots that you have to use soap to get into are my favorite, as long as they fit properly, okay? 99% of the time you come out when you fall. And that's what we want to happen. We want to come out when we fall. Okay. The second boot, the clip in, the reflex, or there's several different companies now that make them, but the, the reflex is what the most common name is. That's supposed to, same thing, come out when you fall. 99% of the time it's supposed to come out when you fall. Now, nothing's fail proof in our sport. We have a high impact sport. Okay. Um, and Greg had a tumble jumping early last year and had on the rubber boots and didn't come out quickly enough and tweaked his knee. Um, tore something in his knee. So, I mean, that's, that's an, another example, but his um, boots were really, really tight for jumping. Um, but generally you come out. Now, on, I don't mean to scare you, Jay, but on these boots, all of them have, most all of them have two strings, okay? You have a bottom string and you have a top bungee. The reason the bottom one is not stretchy is because we want to snug that as tight as we can and keep it tight across the top of your foot so your foot doesn't move, okay? The top one is bungee because they hope that you'll only snug it up enough to keep your foot in there, but it still will allow it to come out when you fall, okay? Now, if you stand on the dock and you go, and you pull it all the way till there's no string left, and then you slide your slide down, your foot is not coming out. So if your toe piece, if your back foot comes out in a fall and your front one doesn't, that is bad. You are asking for injury. So generally, I don't do lace-ups unless I have double boots and they both stay in. Like you can snug them up so they both stay in. Because there's so much lateral support on this boot anyway. This boot is stiff as a hard shell. It's not like a rubber one. It's really, really stiff. There's so much lateral support. You don't even need to snug this up. You just get it a little bit tight, and then we know you're going to come out when you fall. That's the idea, okay? So as long as you feel like you can come out when you fall, or either when you put it on the dock, have somebody step on the back and just try to reap your foot out of it like that, if you can do that, I'm okay with it. I've just seen too many ankles, including my own, um, get messed up. I tore the sheath across the top of my foot when it got stuck, twisted and pointed like that, halfway out. I was in a boot very similar and mine was too big and I had a tournament. My, my boot, my normal rubber boot tore the night before the t competition. So I stuck one on there, cinched it up like crazy and of course fell and twisted my foot. So um, just be careful not to cinch that top one up. The reason, another reason you want to cinch the bottom one across your toes is it creates pressure upward. Okay. So if you have, this sounds terrible. You might want to edit this for a sec, but if you have a pimple on your skin, okay, and you get up under it and you create that pressure, then something's going to come out. That's what the bottom tightness does, all right? It holds it down, creating upward pressure so that if you do fall, it's going to help you come out. That's the idea behind that bottom one being tight too, in addition to your foot not moving, okay? So those are the three types of boots. Just make sure they fit. We made the mistake one time of putting my mom because I certainly didn't want her to get hurt, and if she falls, she kind of yard sales, 
everywhere. So um, we put her in a small instead of an extra small, thinking that's more room for her to be able to come out. Remember that pressure I was talking about that helps you come out? Well, that pressure was gone because her foot was moving around in the ski, so she twisted in the ski and broke a little bone on the, when she fell. So be, bigger is not good. A fitted boot is better because it, it holds you and it creates pressure to come out if you fall. So any questions about that? No? Yes. So I have got a double wear okay. first first year only. Okay. And I I do you want if you have a double wear, do you want them in tighter so nothing falls off? Ideally yes. Okay. So we had this whole debate and a, a man from North Carolina and I were debating this in a tournament one time because we both had double boots and um I have a reflex which pops out and I have a, a wily rubber boot in the back so that slides out, slides right out. I don't have to use soap to get my back one on. It's really, so I come out when I fall. He cinched his super tight, both of them, and wanted to stay in when he fell. He said, I think you either need to stay in or come out. You, this is an Ed Neal story. Yeah. Okay. And he happened to fall really short line, going really fast, forward really fast. And when he did, he snapped both Achilles. Oh. And I'm not telling you that. I don't want to scare you. I'm just telling you, like, I'd ultimately rather come out. But if you have laces, you're pretty much in. And it's extremely rare that something like that happens. He, like I said, he was going super fast. He hit a ball. He went straight forward. Really short line. He was, like, pro skier level. And, yeah. Um, but if you're just, if you're falling over or whatever, you're, you're not going to be creating that much force or pressure on there so yeah i'd say just snug them up but again the tighter you make the top one the less ankle flexion you have and remember we want to be softening our knees and bringing our hips up you don't want to tighten it so tight that you lose your ankle flexion okay also when we have people who go from rubber boots rubber boots are forgiving you can make all kinds of mistakes with rubber boots and it not transfer into your feet into the ski if you have a very stiff boot like this one and you may, and you have it super tight, and you make this tiniest little move. Even sometimes when you move your eyes, it's gonna go. It's very, very sensitive to any kind of movement, good or bad. You know what I mean? So sometimes people are like, oh, "I want a reflex." Well, you have to learn to be a little more still on your rubber boot before you go to a reflex. Otherwise, you're just gonna be wonky all over the ski. So, any other boot questions? No. All right. Any other gear questions? Life jackets should fit. Um, handles, you can have a 12-inch bar or a 13-inch bar if you're slalom skiing. I would recommend the guard. Uh, personal preference. 100% personal preference. I use a 12. How do you know, do you know what, when you're starting it, what's right? A feel. So just try one and the other. Just feel it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Where she gives the example of the elbows, too. Yeah. You need to pick an 11-inch, feel it. 12 inch fill it okay. at 13 because I've seen some people go to a 13 and there's no way they right. can get their elbows here. Because okay. it's too wide. It's too wide. That's right. The standard is 11, like the ones 12. That have 12. 12. 12. 12. I'll start with a 12, just see where it's at. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. different people. I mean, it's just different people where the elbows go. But so, it's very important because, like I said, I've seen people with 13. I use a 13 because I've got a different sure. setup. But with 13, and I've told them, you know, try to pinch your elbows, they can't do it. I mean, because their hands are too far. Mm -hmm. And then you end up grabbing midway the handle. I like to grab on the ends. So, so when you're holding the handle, you should hold it flat. It should be parallel to the water. It's, it's, you'll see some people steering with the handle. That's not good. So turn it flat, leave it flat, squeeze your elbows, and that's where it should be. So I, should you be as wide as the handle? I, I like that. So. I like it as wide as the handle. Okay. Um, just, again, because it keeps your shoulders level. But if it feels like this, then he's right. It's too wide. So we just use 12s by default in the boats. Um, 12s or 13s are allowed in competition. Okay. So it's personal preference. Okay. I do like a handle guard over the middle. I, I haven't started putting them on ski school here because we change handles so much. I need to start doing that. It's a safety thing again. Just so your arm doesn't go through the rope or whatever. I, I need to start doing that. Um, the more aggressive you get, the more important that is to get on there. Mm -hmm. So. Is that allowed in pro It is. In, in any competition, it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Any other gear questions? If you have a thick life jacket, mm -hmm. does that change like, 
Very good question. Yes, a little bit. And I never believed that until I did a photo shoot for HO and they made me wear their Coast Guard approved women's life jacket that had built in padding right here. And I couldn't get my arms together. I, I was like squeezing as hard as I could squeeze and they were right here. So I prefer a lower profile, but we have some Coast Guard approved ones that have padding like down the sides and not so much in the front that you can still do it. Um, Jeff Rogers, who was world champion numerous times, um, still skis in a Coast Guard approved nylon. He even does the nylon because he broke his ribs one time in a thin jacket and now he wears this massive thick one and he still gets his shoulders back. So um, I think it makes you know a little difference. I, had a, I feel like I had a really big life jacket on today and yeah, my arms just felt really Yeah, nice. go to a thinner one. As long as it floats you, we're good. All right, so if I had to pick two things, two words that you need to remember when you leave here. These, two are, these are the two most important things in slalom skiing, technique and timing. Those two things are magical. And that's with any sport, isn't it? Like Landis today was all of his first serves, he was letting the ball fall like an inch too far before he hit it. He was topping the net like every single time on the first serve, he was barely hitting the net. So it was a, what do you call it when it hits the net? Yes, it was a let on the first, so anyway, um, or just inside. And it was just the timing, like the timing was one inch off or whatever it was. And skiing is the same way. So, so technique and timing, we just talked about technique, good body position, shoulders back, pelvis under, arms nice and relaxed and strong here, squeezing but relaxed because we're not gonna pull, okay? And then um, timing, where we're, gonna, where we're gonna cross the weights, where we're gonna look when we, when we make turns and that sort of thing. So we'll start with free skiing. When you free ski, you don't go very wide on the boat. You just pull out to one side, you cruise through, go back and forth, yes? Ideally, we like to keep the line tight so there's no slack. What happens if you get slack rope? Generally, what's happening if somebody's getting slack rope? Too fast across the wake. Catching up with the boat. Too fa not, maybe not too fast across the wake. You are catching yes, up with the boat. Maybe you're going faster than the boat in the turn, so maybe you've pulled too long. Okay, so there's an area right behind the boat. I'm going to draw a boat going down the lake right here. I could have picked any other color except brown. That's okay. So there's the boat, and there's spray coming off both sides of the wakes. You see that? From one side of the spray right through the wakes to the other side of the spray is what we call the work zone. This is the area you need to be in that position that I talked about, squeezing and leaning through the work zone. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. So when I'm skiing, I have a little mantra that I say every time I go back and forth and squeeze is one of them. Squeeze right through the work zone. Don't let the boat move you. Keep your feet out in front of you. Squeeze everything. Stay as still as you can. In my women's weeks, I talk about having a fruit bowl on top of your head. So our shoulders are back. Everything is squeezed. We're looking where we're going and that fruit bowl has to stay on your, bit, on your head and you cannot let it tip top over. Okay? And you do that by absorbing with your knees through the wakes and keeping everything. It's very dainty. It's everything right through the wakes. And then off that second wake, we have to come up and let the ski start to go out and decelerate so we're not going faster than the boat and getting slack line when it's time to go back the other way. All right? So it's just a pendulum. It's just learning to ride a pendulum out with the right energy and back with the right energy. Have you ever pushed a kid in a swing set and you push them too hard and they get to the top and they like fall down and the chain jerks, you know, that's not smooth. That's not the right energy at the right place. You wanna push them right through the bottom so they go up and reach the top and they come back down. Then you push them smoothly again, they go up and they come back down. This is the same thing. It's learning to ride the pendulum, learning where you need to work and where you need to work is right through the wakes in this work zone. And the difference between what you're doing today and tomorrow, so you're on, let's say, a 60-foot line. Okay, you're on 15 off, the red loop. That's where we all start. Sometimes we start longer, but we n never start shorter. Okay? Um, we want plenty of room. We want the, the wakes to be wide enough so that you can manage them without them um, coming together. The shorter the line, the more the wakes come together. Okay? You are shorter today, but that's fine because we've been doing this for a long, long time. Um, but the wider the work zone is, and the, really the smaller the wakes are, okay? The shorter the line, when we start shortening to the orange loop or the yellow loop or the green or the blue or the purple, the wakes start getting closer and closer together to where there's like one bump. 
Okay, and that's a little bit different. You have to take all that energy and you have to squish it into an area, which means you have to increase your energy a lot. Because you've still got to go from point A to point B, but you have less space to do it behind the boat. So you have to really increase the energy right behind the boat. So that area is called the work zone. So if you're free skiing, you just want to make sure that you're nice and still and squeezed right behind the boat. Come up. When I say come up, I mean come out of a lean and you really just pause for a second with your elbows here and then you just look the other way. And then you get into your lean, you squeeze behind the boat, you just stop leaning, come up for a sec, pause, look the other way. That's all we're doing when we're free skiing. When we make the transition from free ski into buoys, what we generally will do is run the, the boat not down the center of the course, but to the side of the course, okay? So the distance from the center of the boat, the pylon, to the red ball in the full course is 38 feet. We're gonna cut that in half. We're gonna just run half of the course, okay? So here's what the mini course looks like. You can either go between these two on lake one, but on lake four, there's not a green one. So we're just gonna pretend, and we're gonna go here, and here, and here, and that's the mini course, and it's really fun. And it allows you to free ski but have obstacles to go around without panicking because it's too wide and without losing your body position and without having to lean so hard. Everything is nice and in control and the speed is good. Okay. From here, maybe we want to get a little wider on the red and get the, the wider yellow. We would never go all the way and get these though because that's so lopsided. Okay. But you can scoot over and get a little bit wider on that one. So that's the mini course. If you're on like one where some of you are going to move tomorrow, for a little more challenge. Our medium course is called the training course. The boat's gonna run right down the center line here, right down the center. As Soon as the boat goes through the greens, you're gonna pull out to your right and you're gonna be out here waiting to go around this green buoy, okay? And you're gonna run green. This is not to scale and green and so on okay you're going to run the green so you're between the greens and the red which is only eight feet those green ones are 30 feet out there they're twice as far as you've been running but the eight feet difference between the green and the red is just enough to still allow you to execute it without losing body position it may take a few times and that's okay but you can do it without losing body position okay um i want to show you something though on a turn this was not a good line let me make a better one Okay, I want you every time from now on, every time you go around a buoy, if that's what you choose to do, and I'm not saying you have to do buoys. I love free skiing. I learned a lesson the hard way. Years ago when I went to Maine to do a clinic, I had this whole big group, and they, I didn't know they didn't run a course. I was going up to teach them to do whatever, but, but they took me to a course, and so I'm teaching everybody the course, and they looked horrible. They were tripping and falling, and, and they were getting angry because this is not what they normally look like, and I'm like, when, how often do you guys ski the course? And they're like, we put it in yesterday because we knew you were coming. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, no. Let me just spend the rest of today watching all of you free ski and work on body position and technique and timing and make sure your, your lines tighten the turns and all that. So we had a great afternoon free ski and it was so nice. And the next day I went to the course and it was a much different story. Um, but I want you to remember this. A buoy is a place where you finish a turn, not where you start. That is one of the hardest things to get through people's minds. A buoy is a place where you finish a turn, not where you start, okay? So if this is the number one ball that I'm going to, I'm gonna pretend like, I, I'm gonna place an imaginary buoy, any color I want, 20 feet in front of the real one and maybe 10 feet wide. So that is gonna be my imaginary buoy. That is where I'm gonna pull out to and start to make my turn so that I come right back behind that ball going the other way. Not only does this give you tons of time to make the next one, but you don't have that sense of urgency that the next one's coming so fast because you've just created so much space before the next one, okay? So normally people would, would come past it and be way down here and all of a sudden, like, there's no way. You're like, oh my God, I can't make that next buoy, okay? But that's because you turned way too late. Start at your imaginary buoy, Finish your turn at the real buoy and aim at the other imaginary buoy. Every time you go across the course, aim at the imaginary buoy in front of the real one. That's the path that I want you to ride. That's the 
path I want you to memorize, okay? Will Asher, have you ever heard the name Will Asher? He's one of HO's pro skiers, has been for years. And we were in California one time at a photo shoot trying out a bunch of gear and it rained all day. What are the chances it rains in California during a photo shoot? They hadn't had rain in like two years. And it rained. So we were out there and we were bored and we went go-karting. And Will is a very, very technical skier and he executes this path really, really well. He'd never go-karted before. We get to the go-kart track and we race and he just creams everybody. He is driving like, a, like he's skiing. And we get out, and the owner of the company, said, the track, says, man, what team do you race for? And he's like, I've never driven a go-kart in my life. And, of course, he's like, you're lying. You, there's no way. He's like, I promise you, I've never driven a go-kart. And he said, how did you know what lines to ride? And he said, I rode the lines as if I was skiing. He took the turns as if he was skiing. So he's starting high, coming back through the turns, accelerating at the right spots, decelerating at the right spots. It's kind of interesting how that works. It's really a game of physics. So if you, learn, if you learn to trust gravity and you learn the swing and you learn to ski like a girl and not muscle it like crazy, then it's easy. It's easy. I know, I know. I tell everybody that. Just ski like a girl. Don't fight it. The harder you fight, the harder it is. Am I wrong, Greg? You taught me something. I mean, years and years of doing it wrong, and I was struggling. I mean, I was... I, jokingly, I was on suicide watch, and she told a story about this rep who was really big. Yes, master. Started at 26 or 28. Yes. 26 miles. He out. was a lineman for Tennessee. Wow. And I mean, this guy was what 200 or something pounds. Uh, Two seventy, six seven. And she asked. Me, 26 she miles an hour. And I was struggling. I said, I need help. And she was struggling. And she stopped the boat. April said, Have you ever tried a slower speed at 28? And I said. No, no right. And he gulps and swallows his pride. And then she said, I want, when she said this, it changes everything. She said, well, I want you to do something for me. She said, I want you to go at 28, and I want you to ski like a girl. <laughs> I mean, she did. And, she told, and I said, okay, what do you mean? She, she told me, you're a manhandler. You're trying to force everything. You just go out there and ski. We the, ran that pass, the next pass, yeah, the it next was the pass. the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. And I'm like, I've been beating my head for years. Yes, years. yes. So every time I go out there, I try to ski like a girl. Yep. <laughs> I didn't do that today. but That's okay. It's in there. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. So I, what, I'm, you may not believe it, but I'm telling you, it is unreal. It and is. I tell guys that, and they still look at me like I'm crazy. That's funny. You no, know, we have to dial it down. Yeah. Most guys do ski super hard. Because you know you can, you have the you have the muscle to do it. So, any questions about timing on the on the turns or on the buoys? It, it's pretty simple, to be honest. June and I were talking today about something I used to have in here until some kids tangled it up last year, and it's called Newton's Cradle. Have you heard of Newton's Cradle? You have. You just don't know it yet. It's a bunch of balls hanging from strings, and you pick up one side, and it hits the other one, and it goes like that. You've seen these in kid videos or whatnot. If you watch baby Einstein videos, they're in every one of them. So when you're going through the, the gates, are you trying to get out as far as the two ball? Yes. Or let me or let me do this, this, and then I'll come to that. Sorry. That's a good question. No, no, I, this is related to that, so that's a good question. Um, so if you... That's, that was exactly what I was getting ready to come to. June was pulling out for her gates today, and she wasn't very wide. Okay, so if she didn't, didn't pull out very far this way, then even with a strong lean behind the boat, she didn't go very far this way, like barely high enough to get around the buoy. Okay, so if you pull a ball up higher in Newton's Cradle and the energy is right behind the boat, like it should be, like your, your work zone, it's going to shoot the ball equally as high on this side. Okay, so however high you need to be, you better be starting that high on your very first turn in. So... When we learn the gates, which is the last thing we learn, once we learn all the buoys, we go back to the gates and learn the gates because they're such a timing monkey that if you don't get them right, you miss all the buoys anyway. Okay? So after you've learned all six, we'll come back and learn the gates. When you're riding behind the boat, getting ready for the gate, skiing behind the boat, I want you to be outside in this whitewash, outside in the bubbles, outside the left wake in the bubbles. This is going to give you a clear line of sight in front of the boat. When the nose of the boat crosses the pre-gate line, 
you pull out to your left, out two, three, glide two, three. At that point, after you physically say, out two, three, glide two, three, at that point, the nose of the boat is now going to be crossing this line. And if you turn in and go, you should go right inside the red ball to your imaginary buoy and then make a turn like that. So why are you gliding on the outside? I know because if you pull out and come straight back, you're going to fall over. And you get a slack too. And you get tons of slack. Yeah, if, you pull, right yeah. if you pull you out and come straight back, unless you're doing a one-handed gait where you pull out, let go, let your ski come back, and that's hard, that's inconsistent. Yeah, if you, and then we're going to add some more stuff like what happens in a tailwind, what happens in a headwind, this changes, okay, when the wind's blowing to your face or behind your back, that this all changes. But in no wind, when the nose of the boat crosses the pre-gates, out two, three, come off your leaning edge, glide two, three, just to slow down a little bit and just do a check to see where you are. The nose of the boat now crosses the gates, you turn in and you lean just like you're leaning from two to three. Don't lean to try to make the gates, just lean like you normally lean from left to right, okay? You may end up here in front of the gates. And at first, I'd rather you do that. I'd rather see you have a nice strong lean than to let up to try to make the gates and then go again because you will not make one ball. There's no way. If you let up to make the gates and pull again, you will not make one ball. April, when you pull out, mm -hmm. out of two, three, mm -hmm. where would you, before, when you start to glide, where are you in relation to that buoy line? You are in, in the buoy line. Buoy line. I'm so sorry. Line yeah, it is if you glance at it and don't stare at it. I don't ever tell people to, to look at it because what happens is people get so caught up in yeah. looking down the line, the gates zoom by yeah. and you've missed them. You're like, oh no, that happened really fast. <laughs> this is literally yeah. maybe three seconds. Yeah. So if you want to just kind of glance and then look back at the boat and as the boat approaches, so when the boat goes through the red, you're turning and going, then you're okay. And if you get wired in the buoy line, that's good. Nothing it, exactly. Because you want to be like the imaginary buoy line. That's right. You want to be the imaginary buoy line. That's